So it is two hours UTC, and it's time for Astronomy Daily Live. So hey, everybody, come on in. Join the, the ever-growing circle of friends as we um, gather together every single day on our, on our virtual porch, uh, just sitting around. The sun here is setting. And it's just a nice, a nice calm evening. So hey, 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 everybody! See, we're all just lounging around tonight. See, we got that. We got um, um, Ralph over here on the wall. So he's always watching. So yeah, hey, hey, everybody, come on in. I'm gonna look at. I'm gonna, I think I've got my chat. Yeah, I got my chat pulled out. I'm going to get rid of that. I think, did I already tweet? Yep, I already tweeted. So we're good there. So come on in, everybody. Nice to see everyone. Bobby, what's happening? Nothing much. Did you, uh, you were on uh, um, Jules' live stream um, um, earlier today, yeah? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Pretty good, as um, usual. Jill has uh, has many um, YouTube channels, but actually one of the ones that uh, I try to, to watch um, when he's on, you know, here he's on sort of in the afternoons, so uh, I'm usually at, at work at that point. But today I took the day off to do some homework, uh, a very, very productive day, which was great. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's got a, a weekly shortwave show. Um, now is he doing that twice a week or, um, or am I just confusing shows because he does a couple of them every week. So, so does he do a shortwave show like Fridays and Saturdays? Is that what he's doing, Bobby? Um, it's, uh, every Friday and every other Saturday. Okay. All right. So every Friday at, I think he starts at 20 hours UTC, um, and then every other Saturday, um, at the same time. And I think he's live streaming tomorrow, um, as I recall. So yeah, yeah, that's always a great thing. If you're into shortwave radio, um... Tune in. He's 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 great. I uh, um, I use him as a model for this show because his show is just so laid back and so casual and so fun. And uh, you know he knows his stuff. He's a smart guy, and and uh, you know he knows um, radio. He knows computers. Uh, so yeah, just a great 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 show. So check him out. Um, uh, let's see if I can find. A link to his um, his channel really quick. Um, I understand. Yeah, let me. Here it is. Here it is. I've got it. I've got it. Just has to pop itself up here. And then I'll put it in the chat. Uh, da -da -da -da. Atta is in the chat. Hey there. Another cloudy night. Ah. Uh, yeah. That's that that is uh that is astronomy for you. So you've got to uh at least in terms of of um, um optical astronomy, yeah, you know, you have to wait until it's dark and you have to wait until it's clear. And then there, there of course, are different levels of clear, right? Um, sometimes you, you have a little bit of muck in the air that you have to contend with. Sometimes you have the moon in the sky, you have to contend with that. So there's all kinds of, all kinds of big, big problems when you get into astronomy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you just have to be um, patient. That's uh, you know one of the reasons why I live where I live here in southeastern Arizona. Is that is that uh, it? It uh, 
it has uh, quite a few clear nights and um, at least um, my location it is dark it is really really dark um, so that's just how I like it absolutely and we've also got Uncle Bill in the panel hey Uncle Bill what's going on yeah yeah hey so yeah you've just been um, dishing out like this these great these great ideas uh, hey, here's another idea for you if you got cloudy night tonight then tune in to YouTube or Twitch and watch the Parker Solar Probe launch tonight. Yes, yes, I was going to mention that. Uh, that is launching at 5:33 UTC, so that's that's at about uh, in about three hours or so. And I will definitely, I will definitely be up. What do you mean about five hours from now? Um. Well, it's two. It's two o six now, and it launches at five thirty three. So that tells. Three thirty three Eastern time. I'll yeah. That in, you too. You yep, five thirty three Universal time. No, so. Oh, uh, I don't think so. I think it's five thirty three, if I remember right. Maybe they changed it. Maybe they changed it because. Uh, yeah, if it is 3.33, which, which, yeah, I was hearing that all day, actually, and it didn't even click, and that puts it at, like, what, 7.33, is that right, or, yeah, 8.33, okay. UT minus 5? Minus 5, yeah, yeah, so if it's 3.33 Eastern, it's got to be 8.33, uh, <laughs> Um, 8.33 um, UTC. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Well, uh... uh I felt like in EDT was negative four, you, four hours behind UTC. Yeah, it's four or five. I guess I guess we're going to have to square that up, but uh, okay. Well, that sort of changes my plans a little bit, but uh, no, I definitely want to see that. So, so, uh... I think both answers are right. You... Eastern Standard is minus five, and Eastern Daylight is minus four. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, all right. Well, so if it's if it's um, three thirty three Eastern, then that would be seven thirty three UTC. So, all right, all right. Well, you gotta do the translation for your own location, but uh, yeah, um, Parker Solar Probe is hopefully. Hopefully on its way, on its way out uh, today. So that that's going to be a it's going to be a pretty interesting um, mission. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll see how all that that goes. They're going to be getting pretty close. You know, they keep saying about you know touching the sun and and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're really not going to get that close. I think the closest that they're going to get is something like four, four million kilometers, which which is absolutely really close, right? I mean, the Earth is, <laughs> yeah, you know, the Earth is like a hundred, um, one hundred and forty million. So, you know, that's uh, it's going to get pretty pretty toasty, pretty toasty, but. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the instrumentation that they have, they're going to get some interesting um, measurements, lots and lots and lots of data, as usual. So, yeah, very, very cool. So, definitely check that out. It's, uh, uh, you know, not not necessarily a convenient time for us, us here in the Northern Hemisphere, but... Uh, these kinds of events, it's like, I don't care. I don't care when it's happening. So, cheers now, to you. I'm wondering when is the Soho batteries going to last for How long Soho batteries going to last long? I think, um, is Soho, is Soto, I, I think Soho is solar powered. I think all those satellites are solar powered. So, uh, those things can last a very, very, very long time. 
very long time. Uh, you know, they're they're going to be more prone to mechanical um, failure, I think, than anything else. So I think, you know, and Soho has um, been up there for, wow, over 10 years, I think, now. So, yeah, absolutely fabulous. Yeah, we're looking at this. That really impressed me that I learned today about the Parker Solar Probe is that first flyby of Venus is late September. And I'm like, wow, how in the world do we get there that quick? <laughs> well, really, really, really fast. And, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, that, that does seem really, really quick. You know, that's, uh, what, like a month and a half or so. Um, but you know Venus is 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 getting ever ever closer to us at this point. So so uh, yeah, it's just a short short little trip over there. Um, yeah, and you know that's kind of the neat thing too. I hope they'll they'll have a bunch of their instruments on uh, as as they do these um, Venus flybys too, because uh, you know that's. Uh, sort of an extra bonus thing. Um, don't know if any of you, um, not sure if um, any of that instrumentation is going to be useful around Venus, but, you know, if they have, you know, like magnetometers and, and, and things, you know, sniffing the dust and everything, then, then pretty much anywhere around is going to be pretty interesting. Uh that was discussed some on the Dots Valdez's uh, Twitch channel uh, with one of the NASA people down there. I don't remember the name. And the instruments for solar observation were not very well suited to making much of any kind of observation. On yeah, I, 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 uh, payload, you know, was as, as a probe on a diet, so there just wasn't room or mass to be able to put instruments on there to take advantage of the thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, though, that, that while that's true, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and Some programmer will figure it out. <laughs> you know, you get the engineers and the programmers together, and and uh, you can do miracles. You know, just absolutely amazing stuff. Um, and scientists too, right? Right? You know, um, uh, you know, um, one person you know, can look at look at data, and you know, be like, "There's nothing here," um, and somebody else can say, "Oh, but but you know, if you." Do this and do that and correlate this, then it's like, oh wow, something interesting. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't be um, too surprised um, if we pull pull out something interesting with um, Venus. You know, I mean, if nothing else, um, it gravity might measurements. Ten years from now, I mean, what was the Galileo and Enceladus? We had that where we found something in ten-year-old data that we never thought to look for. Yeah, yeah, and that was actually um, Europa. That was a plume um, yeah. that they that they uh, I guess actually flew through. So that's sort of the guess, at least. You know, that's based on models and everything else. But but uh, yeah, you know that that data was was um, pretty obvious, right? They just didn't know what it was until now. So uh, yeah, very very cool. So yeah, yeah, just. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you sort of have to to have you know the hoarding mentality, right? That it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to collect all this stuff, right? I'm just going to collect it. I'm going to pile it up, pile it up, pile it up, with the hope that someday something in here is going to be useful. And uh, so that's that's. Uh, uh, I think that's a great attitude to have in terms of data. So, uh, yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it. So, yeah, you know, um, I, I'm going to, 
I'm going to investigate this um, parallax thing too because uh, it it occurs to me that you know if uh, I mean all well not all but many 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 of the spacecraft out there now have um, um, star navigation cameras. Um, so, you know, they're always looking at stars um, in order to make sure, you know, that they're pointing right. Um, so I'm sort of thinking that if that data is available, um, and like with New Horizons, right, which, which is, you know, 40-some um, 40 some um, um, astronomical units away uh, if if they just so happen to to you know image a star where you know we've got some background stars and everything else um, we can do the same thing um, here on earth and we can know exactly what the distance is between those two things and uh, theoretically, we would be able to measure a parallax uh, with a huge baseline, huge, huge, huge. So, yeah, that's actually one of one of the things I want to sort of look at this um, weekend um, is is uh, I'm a sort of investigating that. And then um, Uncle Bill was also talking on the Discord about about um, photographic film. And, and uh, you know, it's like, what's the point, right? And, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to process. It's expensive. Um, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of problems. The one thing that photographic film still wins on, and it's a pretty big win, um, is... Um, pixel size, right? And that is grain size. Uh, you know, the grain size of um, photographic film, um, you know, can be, you know, one or two microns or, or less. Um, and good CCD cameras these days, you know, pretty low noise and everything are, you know, nine microns, 13 microns, um, sort of the larger the pixel, um, um, the less noise you actually have. So, so uh, you know, having a small um, pixel um, CCD um, uh, is um, problematic. One, because of noise. And two, you know, just the electronics, right? Making things that, that small is just really, 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 really hard and you hit a limitation. But, um, you know, uh, I thought of sort of combining those two, right? Take a photograph with your film, right? And then scan it, um, do a digital scan. Um, and you can actually um, magnify that and, and um, the whole thing. So you could actually make, make your pixels, uh, you know, um, um, sub-micron. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, scanners for negatives and uh, slides use optics anyway. So, so. Yeah, yeah, right, right. You know, but you can um, 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 magnify those those um, photographic pictures um, and and um, scan them in too. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting thought, right? And I mean. You know, there's there's an art to um, film photography, right? And um, processing and all of that, and and uh, a lot of that just just absolutely vanished when when um, digital cameras came on the scene um, not too long ago. Uh, but but uh, yeah, you know, there are those who you know hopefully you know still know how you know to process film really really well and and uh i i'd sort of be interested in in um uh, sort of investigating that and seeing 
seeing, you know, if, if those two things can be combined, you know, and actually get the sort of best of both worlds, uh, you know, have, have this high resolution thing for, for film, but then be able to um, still use, you know, the digital um, image. So you could still use all the software, you could still, you know, reduce your data, um, get rid of your darks, get rid of your flats, you know, all of that. Um, because, you know, it's, it's always going to be important to calibrate your data. Um, but it, um, instead of using a digital um, camera, use, use uh, good old film, uh, which, as I said, you know, technically has, you know, smaller pixels. Um, could be interesting. Could be really, really, really interesting. Uh, you definitely probably wouldn't have the volume, right? You know, with um, digital, it's like snap, 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 right? Um, with cameras, um, you know, film cameras, it could be exactly the same thing, but you know, the processing is is uh, time-consuming, painful, right? Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting thoughts, interesting thoughts. So um, it's the hydrogen hydroxide again tonight, HOH, just the nice, calm, relaxing molecule here. One of the most amazing molecules in the universe. So cheers. So yeah, I had a pretty productive day. I, uh, um, I've been working on characterizing this telescope back here. So this is a Nexstar S, uh, 8SE, and I've got a, a S-Big uh, ST7E um, CCD camera. It's, it's really, really old, old school. It uses a parallel port. <laughs> um, and and actually, this computer right here um, is what I use to control it um, and grab all the images. It's running um, CCD Soft version five, which runs on Windows XP. So this is a nice Windows XP machine there, and uh, wouldn't give that up for nothing. But uh, and. Uh, that's sort of a lie, you know, because um, uh, I definitely want to um, do some upgrades, at least eventually. One of the big problems, um, and it isn't a, it isn't a major, major, major problem, but eh, it's kind of a pain, is that is that this guy doesn't really track very, very well. I can get, I can get a a two or three second exposure, and then I start to see little um, little streaks. Um, if you watched uh, my live stream, what a week ago or a couple weeks ago, I forget exactly when I was out out last. You know when we looked at Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, um, you saw you know that the tracking was was uh, just not incredibly good. I mean, it was good enough, right, you know, to sort of keep the object in the field of view, but it it did move, right? These things do do move. So that's sort of a limitation that I have with this now. Um, I need to figure out if if I can um, um, do what's called um, auto guiding. So the camera that I have actually has two cameras. There's sort of a main science camera, and then there's a guiding camera. And the idea is is that you can use that little guide camera um, to identify a star um, in the field of view, um, and then tell it to keep the telescope pointed such that that star stays exactly, exactly like right there. Um, you can specify 
you know, where you want to keep keep that star. And then um, the camera and the software um, running on the computer uh, can keep track of that. And when the tracking goes off a little bit, it can actually send a command to the telescope to you know correct that a little bit. So so um, the idea there is that will allow for longer exposures, right? Uh, um, minutes, hours, whatever you want, um, and and uh, that is very very nice. So um, longer exposures is is nice because you know you'll be able to pick out um, fainter um, fainter things. The um, limitation I have not being able to um, auto guide means that I can I can just take short exposures. But what I can do, right, is I can take uh, a lot of short exposures and then add them all up. So that's what I've been doing. But since my tracking is, you know, makes these objects appear to move all over the um, field of view and sometimes out of the field of view, <laughs> um, I've got to have software to be able to um, stack those up. And, uh, and so, you know, I mean, being a programmer, I can do this, but uh, I was working on this um, and I, I had collected some um, bunch of, yeah. I'm wondering why tracking is that poor on your scope in the first place? Um, typically, tracking isn't all that great on these these kinds of scopes. Um, um, if you're willing to pay, you know, the big bucks, um, you can get a mount that that tracks much, much, much um, better. But um, with 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 these scopes at that price point, um, tracking isn't incredibly good. Um, it's good enough, but it's not it's not great. And so um, that's where um, the auto guiding uh, solves that um, completely. And and um, if I were to um, get that um, working on on this, then wouldn't be a problem at all. But it's just um, 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 it's just the mount. It's just uh, it's just not not that not that great. I mean, it's really, really nice to be able to track a little bit. Um, so, not a problem, especially if I can solve that problem with software. Uh, and I can. And I have. Okay. So, I asked because, you know, I know amateur astrophotographers you know, and of course, they probably blew their budget doing it, getting nice tack mounts and being able to shoot, you know, 200, 250 millimeter focal length with their camera direct for 10 minute exposures and then wait a year or two before they actually get a scope to go on the mount. Yeah, and most, most of those folks are auto guiding so they'll they'll have a guide scope on top that has a separate camera and that yeah. feeds into their software and 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 uh, uh, um, controls the mount now the example I'm thinking about this guy he didn't get any kind of scope at all he just got the mount and put his camera gear he had he already collected some nice camera gear Right, and he put his camera direct on this mount, which you know it looked like you got a beast of the mount and a little camera on it, and he's shooting 250 millimeter focal lengths, and did a lot of great shots with 10 minute exposures for a year or two before he built up the budget to get a scope to go with. It. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, um, like I said, you know, if you're willing to spend the bucks. 
um, you can get a mount that. And that's what I'm thinking. He, he just blew his whole budget on the mount. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, but yeah, um, so back in, back in, uh, back in May, back in May, um, I was looking at a bunch of binary stars and, and uh, uh, running that, that data through my software that actually does, does the stacking, um, I um, came across some kind of a bug in the code where, where um, it wasn't able to find, find um, the binary um, star um, and do you know the proper kind of shifting and rotating and everything um, to to stack. And I looked at it hard. I looked at it. Looked at it. Looked at it. Looked at it. It's like I don't know. I don't know. So so uh, oftentimes, oftentimes, uh, I think uh, not only with um, programming but with with all all kinds of life things. If you can just sort of walk away from it for a while, um, forget about it, right? Just completely forget about it. Um, and then at some point, come back to it, look at it with um, fresh eyes. And, and uh, usually what happens is it's like, uh, well, one, you know, you've got to look at this code and um, I always have to try to refigure out what I was doing, you know, even with comments and everything else, um, which I try to do, you know, I try to comment my code. Um, so, so I'm not completely in the dark, but, you know, even with comments in the code, um, there's sort of a learning curve. It's like, what was I thinking? Right. Um, so the problem that had to be solved right was was that um say that i take um 200 images of a binary star right um but my tracking is such that you know um image one you know, the binary star is say here um second image it's here third image it's here fourth image it's here fifth image i correct it's down here again Sixth image, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, you know, it's just going all over the place, right? So if, um, if I want to be able to, to stack those to do um, sort of a simulated long exposure, um, what I have to do is I have to say, okay, take, take the first image as a reference, right? and measure the positions of those two stars. Okay, let's just say it's a binary star, right? So measure the positions of those two, two stars, okay? Now, take the second image, look, find those two stars, shift them back to the reference, rotate them, right, because I'm on, uh, this kind of mount um, will cause um, field rotation as well. So I have to shift it, I have to rotate it, and then I can stack it, right? And so I have to do that, you know, for say um, 200 images that, you know, uh, that binary star is gonna be all over the place. So I have to, and, and did, uh, write, um, um, pattern matching software, right? So I use the first image as a reference, and I say, okay, this is where the binary star is. This is how um, far away those two stars are um, from each other in um, pixels, say. Um, and so I use that as a reference. And so in the next series of images, I look for that exact same um, pattern. Uh, and uh, so that's the basic idea, right? Look for that pattern. If I find it, I just shift that to the reference point, rotate it, 
and then add it. And, uh, and yeah, I was running it through my data last, last May, three months ago, May to June, July, August, yeah, three months ago. And I was running it through um, some of my data and it wasn't finding that pattern. You know, the program wasn't finding that, that extremely simple uh, pattern. And it's like, what, what is going on here? You know, what's going on? And uh, looked at it, looked at it, couldn't figure it out at all. So it's sort of like, all right, you know, put it away, just forget about it. And, and uh, you know, probably come back to it um, at some point. And uh, actually my, my work with um, Tanagra um, um, Observatory, uh, um, sort of reignited my um, interest in getting back to this um, um, project, which is um, characterizing this um, system you know, to see if I can do astrometry and photometry, um, and and um, how how accurate and precise um, can I measure um, positions and brightnesses of of um, um, stars and galaxies and everything else, right? So um, that sort of re-inspired me. So um, probably Tuesday or Wednesday, it's like, you know what? I'm going to take Friday off from my day job and I'm going to um, revisit the code and see if I can, you know, figure out um, what this bug is that that uh, um, didn't allow it to find that extremely simple pattern, and so that's what I did today. And and um, um, glad to report that that I did find the bug, <laughs> and and so uh, yeah, I'm sort of back back in um, business. I actually made um, some measurements, and I compared those measurements to Gaia. And I, I am within one tenth of a magnitude um, um, of what Gaia says says they are, too. So, so uh, yeah, pretty excited about that. I actually posted uh, some things over on Discord. Maybe I will uh, share those if you didn't see them already, and I can sort of describe a little bit of what I'm uh, of what I'm doing over there. So let's go over there. So here they are. So here's my here's my stacked image. So this is 200 um, images of this binary star. Um, this guy has has the famous name of S STT 93 AP, and uh, as you can see, it's a binary star here. Got a bright, bright component, fainter um, um, component, and as I said, this is a stack of, of 200 um, two-second long um, exposures that have been shifted and um, rotated, hopefully correctly, uh, to properly stack. And it sort of looks like. Um, this is okay. So that's sort of why you're seeing this kind of funny stuff on the edge because my tracking wasn't good enough. So, you know, the image is going to sort of um, move around a little bit. But, of course, the positions of the stars won't. So as long as I shift them correctly and uh -huh. rotate them correctly, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reboot my computer, okay? Okay. Reboot. All right. So I guess that that unit you wrote in Discord that's millimags. Millimagnitudes, yeah. Yeah, you know, that just makes it actually sound um, much better than what it is, right? It's like you know, uh, my telescope, right, is a point two um, meter telescope, which makes it sound really, really cool right but <laughs> right. 
you know, uh, so, so yeah, yeah, you know, that's just a thing to you know, sort of make it sound a little, a little better than what it actually is. It's about a tenth of a magnitude. Um, I'm getting a little bit um, less than that or so, which, which is, which is uh, probably good, um, good enough. <clears throat> But I'm seeing some interesting things in these long exposures, right? The, all these stars have these have these dark shadows. See that? All these dark dark things. I think that is caused by the shutter. Um, there's an actual um, physical shutter on this camera, and I think what I'm seeing there uh, is. Um, some kind of artifact from that. I mean, it's extremely low level, extremely. And then the other, th the other interesting thing is is this stuff. And this, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there yet. Not quite sure. Now I've um, stretched this um, really, really to an extreme. So, so you know, we're looking at at. Um, all the muck, right? There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of junk, but pretty much everything on here is a star. So what I did too is, is uh, I went over to Gaia and grabbed, uh, grabbed that field. So there it is. So we can sort of do a comparison here. So I'll zoom in a little bit. So here is the binary star, right? And then, so sort of right above it in a straight line should be these two stars and a binary star too. And if you look at my, my image, yep, two stars and a binary star, right? So then if you look at this again, sort of over here, we're seeing you know, these two stars and sort of this this grouping here, right? And if you go over here, there it is. There's the little group right there. There's this star right here, which is this guy. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty much seeing every um, every single star here. I think I'm seeing here, and this is going down to 17th magnitude. And my signal to noise on these really, really faint ones is really, really, really low. I haven't measured that yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if the signal to noise is maybe two or three. So is that scientifically relevant? Mm, probably not. But, but the binary star, for sure. You know, this is, um, I think, as I recall from Gaia, I think this is magnitude 5.3. And this is magnitude 8.3. Um, so, you know, signal to noise here is um, really, really great. I've got to measure these these still. But the neat thing is, is that with um, um, with basically what a 400 second exposure, um, I'm seeing I'm seeing 17th magnitude stars. Um, now, whether those uh, are um, relevant? Eh, probably not. But certainly, 15th magnitude stars, I, I probably have a pretty good signal to noise on those. And I would guess that I'd have to look, but, but um, you know, this one's probably close to 15th or so, and maybe a signal to noise of about 10, which, which uh, yeah, that's enough. See, here's a binary down here too. You can sort of see that. There it is, right there. So, so yeah, pretty much seeing everything that um, Guy is seeing. And the great thing is, is that when I measure the relative brightness here, and I compare it to Gaia, um, I'm within a tenth of a magnitude of um, Gaia. So that gives me a lot of confidence and uh, makes me pretty, pretty happy, pretty happy to see that. So yeah, yeah, found the bug in the software. So uh, 
So yeah, it's sort of uh, full steam ahead. Now the second problem that I've encountered is that um, now all my measurements are pretty precise, but some of the measurements I've made with um, other binary stars, I've also looked at at um, some of the um, um, open clusters. Uh, I've noticed that my magnitude um, differences there compared to Gaia are uh, oftentimes like way, way, way off, you know, like half a magnitude, one magnitude. Um, and so I'm not quite sure why I'm seeing inconsistent um, accuracy. This is an example um, where I'm extremely close, extremely close. Um, but I have another um, binary system that I need to look at again, but um, taken, you know, the same night, um, reduced it exactly the same way, you know, same flat field, same everything. Um, but uh, I'm getting a difference when compared to uh, Gaia. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on there yet. I'm going to get to the bottom of that, though. But, uh, yeah, not quite sure what's going on with that, with that yet. And, you know, maybe it has to do with the bug in the software um, that I found. I'm kind of thinking that it isn't. But, yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a little job for the um, weekend. Speaking of the weekend... I do need to remind everybody that tomorrow, tomorrow, um, the live stream is canceled. Canceled. So, uh, yeah, I've got a musical gig. I'm going to be um, playing out on the keyboard over there. I, 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 I did successfully uh, reinstall that, that um, circuit board. And, uh, you know, it's always um, sort of a nail biter. Right, you pull a circuit board out of you know something as complicated as this thing, and you mess around with it, right? And one never knows if it's going to turn on again and work. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, reinstalled it, plugged everything back in, and uh, yeah, it it works and. The, um, the button that I fixed for the fourth or fifth time is now working again. Uh, for the most part, it's got about a, a nine, I guess it works maybe 90% of the time or so. So there's something, there's something funky going on there, there still that I haven't worked out. But yeah, even if that button didn't work. I sort of have a workaround. It's just a lot easier with that one button um, working. And and um, Kitty Cat over there is making sure that nobody else touches that keyboard. So she's <laughs> so so she's in charge of of uh, yeah making sure that that you know, the keyboard. Uh, isn't messed with and is in good working order uh, for the gig tomorrow. So yeah, you know, I I probably I probably will be home in time, but you know, there's only one thing that I can think of that I really, really, really hate, and that is hurrying and rushing. So if um, so, if I can avoid having to hurry and rush, I will do it. So, uh, you know, if that means I have to cancel a live stream, so be it. Uh, because, yeah, you know, having to, you know, have to rush out of there, um, zoom home, get all set up and everything, nah, nah. This is too casual and too much fun to really take that seriously. So, once in a while, I'm going to have to cancel a live stream, you know, for one reason or another. And uh, you know, the reason 
you know, once in a while, might be, it hasn't um, really happened yet. But, you know, um, I can certainly envision, you know, once or twice being like, you know what, I just don't want to do it tonight. <laughs> so that, that hasn't occurred yet um, because I think this is really, really fun. You know, sitting around um, for about an hour and just um, chit-chatting, uh, all things astronomical, you know, talking about um, my own work, all that. All right, Bobby is back. Hey. You had a successful reboot. Yay. Yeah. For some whatever reason, I can't get the Jack audio server to work. Huh. These machines, you know, they're they're uh, um, they're they're really 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 great when they work, and they really 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 suck when they don't work. <laughs> it's like a it's like a Boolean thing, right? It's either like really awesome or really bad, and there's nothing in between. So, yeah, well, good, good. I'm glad. To, uh, you know, I also say you know that I I wish. I wish that, that I I had a reboot button, right? You know, that I could just sort of sort of push and just sort of reset, right? And um, I could certainly wish that upon uh, others as well. You know, I would certainly like to reboot um, some people's um, uh, um, um, systems as well because uh, it's like, man, you need a reboot. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. I think that uh, I think that sort of updates everybody on my um, project here in terms of characterizing this this beast. Um, yeah, I think I'm I think I'm back on that. Um, I'm going to be looking at um, my binary star data again um, this weekend with this fixed up code um, and. See, see if the accuracy inconsistency um, persists. Because if it does, then I'm going to have to really, really, really think hard about why sometimes um, when I compare um, my measurements to Gaia, they're, they're like dead on. And with other, other stars, other binary stars, on the same evening, using the same flats, the same dark frames, the same bias, everything else. Um, uh, my measurements are so far, or yeah, so far different um, than Gaia. So not quite sure what's going on there. Um, you know, I'm starting to grasp at straws, and it's like, well, you know, maybe, um, maybe these stars are variable stars. And and so you know when Gaia um, measured them, um, they had a certain brightness, and then when I'm measuring them, they have a different one, and that's why I don't know. I don't know. Um, I can't really come up with any any other explanations at this point. You know, if if all the measurements were off, then I could sort of go down. One particular path, right? But the fact you know, that some of my um, measurements are are you know as close as you know, fifty or sixty millimagnitudes, um, while others are you know five hundred or a thousand millimagnitudes off. I don't know what's going on there. I'm not quite sure yet. So uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. I'm. Uh, I'm sort of back on this now, you know, that I've got the software working again. I'm sort of back on this, and uh, actually, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've got a lot of data. I've got lots and lots and lots of data, so I'm not starving for data yet. Um, but, you know, if I can't figure this out, then I'm going to try to think about, you know, my observing technique. You know, what... What am I doing while I'm taking calibration data? Um, uh, you know, what am I doing when 
I'm collecting the science data. Is there anything, you know, funny that I'm doing, which would cause um, these kinds of um, inconsistencies? And I, I don't know yet. Uh, as I said, you know, one possibility is that these stars are variable stars. Um, but I don't know, you know, that's sort of a stretch, it's sort of a stretch. It's a possibility though. I mean, most, most stars are actually variable stars. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to, uh, investigate that a little bit. Um, I think I'm not quite sure if, if Gaia flags stars as variables or not. So, you know, if it does, then, you know, maybe that's what it is. Not quite sure. Not quite sure. Not quite sure. But it's sort of nice to be back on that um, project. So, so uh, because there's some interesting possibilities. If um, uh, I already know um, the astrometry uh, is about as good as I can expect. I'm getting about a third, um, like a third of a pixel um, resolution in terms of astrometry um, when I compare my measurements to Gaia. So, um, yeah, you know, if I'm getting sub-pixel um, 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 accuracy, uh, then, then, you know, that's as good as I can get. So that's not bad at all. It's the photometry that's sort of um, throwing me at this point. So, uh, but if, um, if I can iron that out, then I can sort of proceed. And, and uh, yeah, um, um, the possibilities there are pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, we'll sort of see where all that, where all that goes. So, let's see, it's, uh, well, it's, it's 257. UTC. We're getting pretty close to the top of the hour here. I'm sort of wondering. I'm sort of wondering if I should uh, maybe start wrapping this up, unless unless either Bobby or um, uh, Uncle Bill has has got anything else. Uh, Ad has been asking about the the barn door mount in the chat. Oh, okay. I you know I haven't been paying attention to the chat at all. So let me uh, let me back up here and and uh, digitize do-it-yourself equatorial mount um, or digitalau. Um, I Ata, I I don't think I've ever heard of a barn door mount um oh you have you don't know what a barn door mount is i've i've never heard that term okay uh it's basically just two pieces of material wood is common uh with something like a piano hinge holding them together and you have a threaded bolt going through with some probably a stepper motor turning the bolt to open up those two pieces of wood at the same speed as the earth turns. The, of course, the hinge is pointed along the pole axis. Hmm. And it's just a really simple DIY kit that you can mount a camera to and get five, 10 minutes of tracking through, you know, where no, no great focal length, say a 50 millimeter lens and avoid the trail. Let me, uh... I'm going to share my screen again. Let's let's just go look and uh, see. There's one posted in Discord, like she mentioned. Okay. Uh, uh, look at the... it's, it's a DIY thing that's real common. I've seen over a dozen different plans scattered all over the internet. Oh, very cool. Well, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to... Uh, yeah, and it's old school, too. Cool. I want to... Uh, I want to go, and I'll take you guys with me. Let's go over and find find this thing. 
So it's called a barn door mount? Well, yeah, because the, the, the mechanism is almost that simple. You know, you just, you've got the two pieces hinged together like a barn door, and you line up the hinge parallel to the pole axis. You know, it's pointing at the North Star for us. And you've got a little motor that's regulated to speed somehow. Nowadays, it's stepper motors are cheap to turn a threaded bolt. There you go. You had a picture for a second. Yeah, I've got it there. And that just makes moves one of the boards. The board that your camera's mounted on is, you know, this is all timed and you've got to do a little bit of math on how your rod is threaded and how fast the motor turns it. Oh, and some of the real simple ones, you actually turn the bolt by hand. You just, you know, you got some sort of clock that tells you it's time to add another turn to the screw or something. Very cool. And that avoids the trail so that you can get, you know, a few minutes of exposure time with a normal focal length lens. Yeah, pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Yeah, you know, I have seen seen these. It's just... Uh... Yeah, I, I, you know, names. <laughs> Let's see, this is a, okay, <laughs> look at that. They're actually using a. Yeah, and that, and that one is hand operated. There's no motor to it. Yeah, sweet. So the idea is, is that you turn this that yeah, you might have, you might have something like WWV playing in the background. And, yeah. you know, it's every 30 seconds you add, you know, another so many degrees to that disc to keep the camera moving at the right speed. Right. So this axis here it would be pointing north. Exactly. Right? Okay. And then this screw um, would either open this hinge or close this hinge depending on which way you're going i guess it'd be opening it right if you're going to be tracking uh, yeah, you want to start uh as as one of those trigonometry things as your angle gets wider your relationship your motion is not linear right so yeah. it only works across small angles that is that is sweet that is sweet yeah, nice. Yeah, and and if you're dealing with a wide field of view, then then yeah, you you don't really have to have to, you know, actively track. You just have to make sure that it's about right. So nice. Yeah. Sweet. I like it. Let's see. Uh, and got... Like I said, a lot of them I've seen you they just have real simple uh, stepper motors. I yeah, yeah. Uh, and something you know you don't even need an arduino for that you can build a little uh circuit board you know yourself that's just you know a dozen components to control the stepper motor right and yeah he's actually you know, like i said if you're starting from scratch and modifying much on the plans then you need to do some math to get uh, just the right speed out of it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the picture here, but but uh, but there's you know. there's a lot of plans on the net too that already have the math worked out. For yeah, them. very cool. Very cool. So uh, there we go. So there's another example. So they actually yeah, that's have what I'm used to seeing right there. Gotcha. So they actually have a little um um. Um, finder scope to pull their line. Yep. Sweet. That is very cool. It's very, very yeah, it's, cool. You know, it's something you can build dirt cheap. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, as long as it's um, polar aligned, you'll do fine. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, I mean, that's great if you just want to get, you know, like a, a panoramic shot of the Milky Way or something. Absolutely. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, or a really big comet, maybe? Yep. So there's just a couple of examples. Here's the constellation Orion here. You can see Betelgeuse, Rigel, M42. This is um, Barnard's loop. Yep. There's some fuzz uh, up here. The caption does not tell how long an exposure that was. Yeah, it doesn't say. It's, I'm um, thinking, I've heard of people getting up to like 10 minutes exposure. Yeah, I think, you know, with that, Barnard's that loop. Probably with a 50 millimeter or shorter. Yeah. Actually, here's the Heidi's over here, too. Cool. Yeah. There you go. You've even got a little parts list. Little plans. Look at that. Far out. You know, you could put a you smartphone. See how simple the circuit is. Yeah, yeah. You could put a um, smartphone on these mounts, and and wow, that'd be great. Yeah. Very cool. I, I've got Damien looking at those too. Nice, nice, nice. All right, what else is in the chat that I missed? Uh, Atta knows her way around the toolbox. I think everybody should. Amen. <laughs> Nah, you know, carpentry is, uh, uh, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but carpentry is, is, uh, is definitely, you know, a skill that somebody has to, has to have, but a lot of it has to do, do with the tools. So if you've got, you know, the right tools, uh, you're, you're 90% there. But yeah, pretty simple. Pretty simple, you know, just some plywood and yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I've definitely seen these. I just, yeah, I mean, names usually escape me. <laughs> pretty nice. Pretty nice. All right. Well, cool. I think. Um, if nobody has anything else, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. Uh, stop sharing. All right. Well, very very cool. All right. Also, anybody that might be risking cloudy nights this weekend, I want to recommend you keep an eye out on uh, Damien Explorer's channel on Twitch. Uh, really looks like he might do a, a Pleiades stream this weekend. You're talking about Perseids, yeah? Perseids, that's what I mean. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, anybody who's going to be having clear skies this weekend, um, get out. Yeah, if you got clear skies, go see it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, spend an hour or so. It doesn't really matter when. Um, if you can spend an hour after midnight, you know, like 1 or 2 or 3 a.m. or so, um, that that is better, but pretty much any time of night, um, preferably when it's um, um, where it's dark. So you know, if you're living in the city, eh, you're still going to see them, but you're only going to see um, 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 the brighter ones. Um, where I am, I'm I'm going to see every single one that's possible. Um, so it just has to be clear, right? It's got to be clear, and uh, so yeah, take a look. Um, I've been monitoring that that um, that site, uh, the International. Um, I'm a, I'm a, what's it called? The International Meteor um, Organization. Um, they've been showing uh, you know, their latest um, um, data in terms of of, of uh, rates. And it is going up. I think they're up to about um, like 30 per hour or so now. So, you know, still not incredibly much.
but uh, we we really haven't um, started the main shower yet. That'll um, um, that'll be going on over the next few few days or so. And I guess there's a prediction that it's peaking like on the 13th. I forget exactly when, um, but uh, you know that's just a prediction. You never know uh, when exactly the peak is going to be. Um, so yeah, get out um, this weekend. Take a look at that. As I said, tomorrow night's um, live stream here is canceled. So I will see you all in, uh, I guess, a little less than 48 hours from now. Um, so hope everybody has a good good night, a good day. Um, Parker Solar Probe is also being um, being launched in a few hours. I guess at uh, 3.33 Eastern Daylight Time, which I guess will be 7.33 UTC. So uh, a little bit early for us to over here in the West, but um, definitely definitely worth uh, um, staying up or getting up um, to watch that. Um, it's, um, I, th I think the Delta IV Heavy right now is the most powerful rocket in the world is that is that true not quite sure it's a big one it's a big uh, it's a i'm not sure if falcon heavy is but of course it's not doing any operations yet yeah yeah but the delta 4 heavy is a big is a big mother yeah it's a monster it's a monster and you know, there was so much Delta V needed for that. Uh, the probe is tiny. It's like, you know, a small, small economy car as far as its weight because they even had to pack in another solid fuel stage on top of the second stage yep. to get enough Delta V on that thing. Yeah. That's probably part of the reason why it's getting the Venus so quick. And then Venus is going to do the rest of the work with five or six flybys, which will probably be over the next four years or so. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, that's sort of the plan. You know, they'll they'll zip around you the just, each time. Yeah, you don't just drop stuff into the sun. Is you've actually got to kill all the velocity you have from being on planet Earth to get there. Yep, that's and that's a exactly. big job. It's a big job. You need a big rocket to do that, and uh, yeah, you, uh, that rocket can, can, and hopefully will um, um, deliver. I think um, um, ULA has had uh, um, well over a hundred um, successful launches. So, so uh, um, yeah, it's you know pretty much guaranteed you know, to go. Um, so uh, yeah, pretty exciting. Um, it'll. Um, it's always nice to see um, those kind of spacecraft off, right? Um, you know, launches of um, um, communication satellites and all that. Those are really really cool, but you know, this is a space probe, right? Um, this is going to be doing some really interesting science um, about about you know. This object that that uh, we can't really figure out. <laughs> so uh, you know, um, if nothing else, we'll have lots of data to play with, and and uh, yeah, we'll see how that that goes. It's a long mission, but um, uh, they're definitely going to have. Uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it's solar powered, isn't it? Uh, gotta be. I'm pretty you know sure. What? I haven't really studied up on the Parker Solar Probe that much. Yeah, I'm. Uh, <laughs> a lot of what I know about it is just what I picked up on Twitch today. <laughs> yeah, I. You know, I. I'm not sure. You know, because they're talking about pretty extreme temperatures. So. I don't know. Maybe it's nuclear. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean the whole probe's behind that sun shield anyway. It's got yeah. a really complicated system to keep it behind that shield. 
Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure how solar power would work on that situation. I'm not sure either. Everything around that is geared by keeping it in the shadow. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe uh, next live stream, uh, which will be happening on the 13th, um, we'll take a closer look at um, PSP and uh, you know get this all worked out. So uh, yeah, all right. Well, I think I'm going to get out of here for today so thanks for coming in smash the thumbs up if you so um, desire make sure to subscribe if you haven't already you can hit the um, notification bell too and you'll be uh, you'll be uh, informed as to when I go live but that happens every single day practically every single day at two hours UTC all right you guys I'm gonna get out of here for now so I will see you in two spins. One, two. Two spins. Later, Little nerds. And 48 hours from now. So take care, everybody. I will see you later. Bye. Later.